12 nothing but mysteries. The large clock that sat upon the wall of Caddick Academy struck midnight. Jeremy heard the dismal sound from his room. He then turned on the light, because obviously, he wasn't going to get any sleep. He got up and placed himself at his desk. He took a notebook and a sheet of paper, then started to calmly list all the problems that have presented themselves and the information they'd collected so far. One professor hurts, what does she know about Hopper? Why is she keeping a file on him? What do the codes mean? And the address in Brussels? He sighed. Nothing but questions, and he'd only just started. To the man with dogs, who is he? What does he want? Why did he attack Odd and Yumi's parents? Who will be the next victim? This thought made him freeze. His parents lived far away from Kadok. Maybe that would keep them safe, or maybe not. After all, Odd's parents also live in a different city. The student preferred not to think about it. 3 Richard, why did so much code appear on Hi's computer? Was it Hopper who sent them to him? And why does A. Elita treat him like some sort of god? Jeremy sighed and erased the last sentence. It wasn't exactly correct. It was true that his heart had almost stopped when the girl had told him that she saw Richard in a cafe that morning. But for the moment, it was of no importance. For Hopper, what is the significance of the video he pushed us to find? And what must we do to help Elita find her mother? 5XANA As he wrote these initials, the hand holding the pen stopped dead. XANA had been destroyed, that, at least, they were sure of. But what if that wasn't the case? Odd hadn't managed to sleep either. He couldn't stop seeing the darkened eyes of Mr. Ishiyama superimposed over those of his father after he'd been attacked. Usually, the student was always in high spirits, but recent events were starting to seriously trouble him. Someone had rang the doorbell and lured his father into the garden to do something to him. Odd was now convinced that it wasn't a kidnapping attempt, if not the same thing would have happened to Yumi's parents. The important question was therefore to find out what the man with two dogs wanted, what was he doing with cabled gloves? How did he manage to erase his image from the video Jeremy had recorded in the Hermitage? Suddenly, he remembered the strange memory card that his mother had given to him at the hospital. He leapt out of bed, then began to rummage through his jacket pockets. He took out the small, black, plastic rectangle. He observed it. Nothing. No writing, just three or four golden marks on one of the sides. Odd side, he knew nothing about technical things, but Eva, on the other hand, seemed rather gifted in that area. It was really thanks to her that he'd discovered the image of the man with dogs on the Hermitage surveillance video. So she could surely help him discover what was hidden on this plastic thing. And then, tomorrow was Sunday, an opportunity for him to visit her. He might even be able to meet her parents and stay at her house for a while. Fantastic. He rifled through the mess on his desk to find the scrap of paper on which he'd written Eva's address and phone number, Rue Andre René. It was only 2 o'clock in the morning. But he still decided to call Jeremy, who immediately picked up. Apparently you haven't managed to sleep either. No Jeremy said. I was in the middle of studying how to force the lock on the apartment for Ulrich and Yumi. Our little computer hacker. Odd laughed. I just wanted to tell you that you won't see me tomorrow morning. I'm going to see Eva. Jeremy's voice immediately became more somber, what do you have in mind? Nothing, nothing, don't worry, hey, Odd, you're not going to do some films about Eva, by any chance. And what if I am? She's a great girl, isn't she? Odd didn't talk about the memory card, because if Jeremy had seen it, he would immediately set to work on it and he wouldn't have an excuse to go to Eva's house anymore. So for that reason, you intend to go behind Jim Morales back again. Jeremy questioned. You really are a genius, Einstein. Odd responded before hanging up. Sunday morning arrived quickly. Dark clouds hung heavy with the threat of rain, but that didn't deter Odd. Rue André René was large and long, bordered by tall trees that shook in the violent wind. Two rows of small, tidy houses with black roofs and wooden walls, all painted white, lined up in front of the boys' gaze. What rotten weather! Odd thought, shivering. Suddenly, lightning lit up the sky, and a large drop of rain fell onto his nose. Then another, then another. He shot beneath the trees like an arrow, being very careful not to slip on the footpath that had been dirted by sleet in previous days. He then looked for the numbers written on the letter boxes. 30. 
28. The rain intensified, and in but a few seconds, he found himself soaked to the bone, his blonde hair stuck to his face, and his clothing weighing a ton. He accelerated again, upset about having to present himself to evil like this, but he no longer had a choice. It was impossible to return to Kadok in this torrential rain. 18, the 1 and 8 were painted in red varnish. Ah jumped onto the doorstep, protected by a canopy. He rang. No response. He tried again, and afraid of not pressing hard enough, he tried a third time, dr 3 ee Finally, the door opened. Eva was wearing a tight tracksuit. Odd, she said, smiling. Hi, he responded. I was just passing by, and it started to rain, so, suddenly, he realized that it was only half past eight in the morning. He murmured, feeling uneasy, I haven't woken up your parents, have I? No, no. I'm alone. My parents are at work. Working, on a Sunday. Odd thought to himself. Would you mind if I come in for a bit, to dry myself off, he said, embarrassed. Please. Eva responded. Come in. You're drenched, get undressed. Odd stopped dead, unable to respond, which was rare for him. Get undressed? Did she really just ask him to, undress? Um, would you, by any chance, have some clothes I could borrow from your father? No. He looked all around him. Actually, it seemed like a number of things were missing from this house. Moreover, it was barely furnished. The front door faced a small hallway that led directly into the living room, and an empty room that had nothing but a laptop sitting on the floor. It was the same thing for the kitchen, no sink, no furniture, no oven, and no stove. Four walls and within them, completely empty. Only a few gas and water pipes hanging from the ceiling. As for the boiler, it was just fixed to the wall. Where's the bathroom? Odd asked, astonished. Over there, the girl indicated. At the end of the hallway. The hallway opened onto two empty rooms that didn't even have beds in them. In one of them, there was just a pink suitcase, open, and full of clothes. And in the bathroom, there was still a sink, a toilet, and a towel. Odd used it to fix his hair. When it came to his jacket, sweatshirt, pants, and even his shoes and socks, everything had to be dried. Only his t-shirt remained dry, so he decided to keep it on. He got undressed, took the memory card, wrapped the towel around his waist to hide his underwear and returned to the living room. Eva was waiting for him, seated on the floor with her laptop on her knees. She looked at Odd humorously. You're almost naked, she murmured. I don't think that's very good. Me neither. Odd nodded. But with drenched clothing on, I could catch a cold. Wait. Eva stood, disappeared into one of the rooms and came back with a fluoro pink tracksuit. Odd took it, sighing. The tracksuit was very tight and the pants far too short. Nothing like the James Bond look. When she saw him in that getup, Eva laughed at him. He tried to distract her attention, your house's decor is, um, a little refined, isn't it? But he then held his tongue, because after all, what did he know about her family? Anyway, he said to save himself. You've just moved in, it's normal. If you want, you could come spend some time in the dorms, waiting for your stuff to get here, the beds and all that, I'm perfectly fine here Eva responded coldly. But of course, he quickly said. Uh, me too. I like it here a lot. Odd sat near Eva, then showed her the memory card. Eva, I'd like to ask you for help with this thing. I found it, and I don't know how to use it. The girl seized the card and observed it with shining eyes, as if she could see within it. Then, she slipped it into the laptop and typed on some keys. It's just a video, she announced in a neutral voice. Okay, I'm starting it. Odd held his breath as an image appeared on the screen. It was a lovely looking woman, dressed in a white shirt. Her hands and feet were tied to a wooden chair, and thick, red hair fell messily over her shoulders. A man's hand, wearing a black glove, suddenly placed itself in front of the woman, brandishing the front page of a newspaper, The Investigator. The date had been highlighted in yellow, 2nd of May 1994. Odd covered his mouth with his hand, stupefied. Then, he exclaimed, this video is way old. It was just before Ilita went to Lyoko with her father. And this woman must be, red hair, the shape of the nose and eyes, but of course, it was Anthea, Ilita's mother. Held prisoner. The newspaper disappeared from the screen, 
revealing the woman once again. She began to speak, I'm doing fine, Waldo. Don't worry about me, they're keeping me prisoner, but everything will be. Her face suddenly changed to a look of infinite sadness. She slowly bowed her head and began to cry. How is Elida doing? It's been years since I've seen her. She must be going to primary school now. Has she grown up? I want to kiss her so much, the woman sobbed, when a masculine voice ordered from off screen, finish it. Say what you know and that's enough. Anthea raised her head, her face full of hate as she turned towards the man that spoke. Waldo, she continued, crying these men are making me ask you to continue to work, to take down Project Carthage. If you do it, they'll free me and then we can be together, you, me and Elida, like a family again, suddenly, the woman raised her head, frightened, and quickly whispered, don't do it, Waldo. They'll never let me go and they're trying to kill you. Let Carthage go and save yourself, get far away, the silhouette of a man then entered the image, hiding Anthea. There was a click, then the image disappeared in a shower of sparks, and the video stopped. I'd almost knocked Eva's laptop over. We have to warn Jeremy and Elida, and show them this video, he cried, leaping up. No. Eva responded in a clear tone. Don't you understand? Odd protested. That woman was Elida's mother, and now we know that she's alive. Or that she was alive at least 10 years ago, and that she was held captive. Jeremy could analyze the video and discover something. No. Eva repeated, also standing up. What has gotten into you? Odd responded, stupefied. The girl slipped a hand into her pocket. But when she took it back out again, it took Odd a few seconds to comprehend what she held in her hand. This was crazy. Why would Eva have a switchblade knife, with a blade shining sinisterly but a few centimeters from his face? You're not going anywhere, stupid human, she let out in a strange voice. Eva's lips moved, but her voice was no longer her own. It was distorted, as if it had been spoken directly from computer speakers. A masculine voice. A deep one. I knew this voice all too well. It was that of their mortal enemy, XANA. 13 The replica Ulrich and Yumi awoke early, also leaving a note for the Ishiyama's friend. She was a kind woman in her 30s, with a slightly hippie look, and who had welcomed them without asking any questions. She lived in the middle of the city. But the teens had to run from one hardware shop to the other during lousy weather to find the components that Jeremy described to them via email. Then, they sought refuge in Bois de la Camber, a park near Rue Lemonnier, to proceed with the installation. 122 euros. Bullrich sighed as he took the material out of his backpack, it would have cost us less to go back to Caddick and have Jeremy build this electronic thingy. Instead of moaning, why don't you give me a hand? Yumi asked. The instructions seemed complicated. They had bought an electric screwdriver, a series of needles and fine tipped iron, a hammer drill, batteries, and a bunch of other stuff. Now, they had to assemble everything to create what Jeremy called the electronic lock pick. Where did he learn how to do this stuff? Bullrich asked, unscrewing the body of the drill to disassemble it. Jeremy said that he found it all on the internet, Yumi explained. Look here, he wrote. Position the needles on the closure pivot of the lock cylinder and give it large strikes in a way that will initiate a ball mechanism which... Okay, okay, Bullrich sighed. It's completely incomprehensible. But did he say anywhere where we need to insert this thing into the electronic thingy? Ha ha, the young girl replied. I didn't think that Jeremy wrote electronic thingy. The two lovebirds continued to work until around midday, sitting on a bench, in the icy cold. From time to time, Bullrich would observe Yumi, she was still in deep concentration. The day before had been so beautiful that he hadn't found the right moment to talk sincerely with her. He didn't want to wreck the magical atmosphere by risking starting a fight. Though she'd told him that it'd be better if they remain just friends, he really had trouble supporting the idea. So, he had waited to talk to her. And he was still waiting. He thought of stopping for a moment to take her hands and look into her eyes. No, not yet. Not while they were passing screws and nuts to each other. Later. Yumi brushed the hair away from her forehead and finally announced, that's good. This machine should be ready. You can take out the lock we bought. We're going to give it a try. That too was written in Jeremy's instructions, using the electronic lock pick as NT simple, practice with it where an obody can see you. A 20 euro lock straight out the window. 
Bullrick groused while taking out the brand new lock from his backpack and trying to use the electronic instrument to open it. Jeremy had warned them. This operation wasn't at all evident to the naked eye. Bullrick gave up about half an hour later. I can't feel my hands anymore, he groaned. It's freezing cold, and if you ask me, we made a mistake while we were building it. This thing will never open. Wait, Yumi said, I'm going to try it. She took the lock in her hands and as soon as she did so, the lock pick engaged the switch. Then, she gave it a small whack with her fist, and... Click. The pistons came back, and the lock opened. Beginner's luck. Bullrick muttered, annoyed. It's all in the movement, his friend laughed. In any case, now I know that I can become a burglar. Come on, let's move. We need to get back to Kadok tonight. Rue Camille Lemonier was deserted, and even the cafe on the corner was closed. As they reached number 14, Bullrick let out a sigh of relief, at least they were at less risk of getting in trouble. Let's hurry, Yumi, he said as he passed her the electronic lock pick. If someone sees us and calls the police, we're going to get into real trouble, don't worry, she responded confidently. She put the device to work and not long after, they heard the metallic sound of the lock opening. They entered. The building's lobby faced a small landing reachable using a marble staircase with a fine forged iron railing. On one side they saw a wooden door, closed, from which a musty smell escaped. Nobody's been here for centuries. Bullrick observed. Have you noticed? Yumi cut in. There are no surveillance cameras. Maybe the owners aren't really secret agents after all, the closed door had no name on it, nor a doorbell. After a brief moment of thought, they decided to investigate the general area. So, they adventured up the staircase. The building was eight stories high and each opened onto a hallway with no windows, arranged with four identical doors with neither numbers nor names. Most of the doors were closed, and the only open ones showed completely empty apartments. Arriving on the third floor, Bullrick and Yumi began to lose hope. And on the sixth, they were even more discouraged. They climbed up to the eighth floor at a running pace, soon ready to return to Kadok without having found anything. Nothing here either, Bullrick sighed, breathless. What do we do now? Try to open each door one by one. Wait, that one seems different to the others, look. Yumi breathed, indicating to a door a little further away. Bullrick approached it. Even though it was made of dark wood like the others, it had a more solid and massive aspect, and the lock seemed to be reinforced. They examined it for a moment, then decided to try their device. Yumi's instinct may have been right. They tried the lock pick three times, and the lock opened. Bullrick opened the door wide. Both of their jaws practically dropped to the floor. The apartment was just one large room that resembled an old office. The floor was covered with thick, beige carpet, and on the walls, there was horrible wallpaper in the same color. Dozens of screens and electronic equipment, as well as other giant computers, sat on an immense steel table. The equipment was so cumbersome that it covered up part of the only window. When Ulrich advanced, a thick cloud of dust rose from the carpet, making him sneeze. He approached the table. On it, there were motorcycle helmets equipped with strange devices and gloves connected to wires that relayed to a computer. Then, on the side, there were several yellowed keyboards that were at least 20 years old, and large cathode ray tube monitors that must have weighed a ton. If you ask me, Yumi declared. Yes. That's a supercomputer prototype. Like the one at the old factory. And these helmets and gloves could be the predecessors to the scanners, are you kidding? Bullrick replied nervously. So you're saying that this place is, an access point to Lyoko? Not really. Maybe just a copy of Lyoko. I think that, technically, the exact term is replica. Yumi moved a large stack of paper from the desk, and freed a large black box adorned with a large lens on the front. This resembles the holographic projector that Jeremy uses to control our movements when we're in the virtual world. And this other thing, she then indicated to a device composed of mirrors and cables relayed to the motorcycle helmets. This resembles the electronic thingy, as you call it, and it's mounted on the scanners at the factory. Bullrick sat on the floor and ran his fingers through his hair, annoyed. That's crazy, he exclaimed. What do you propose we do? Seems clear to me. Yumi responded, winking at him. Turn everything on and see if I was right. But, if it really is a replica, like you say, Bullrick spluttered, x.a.n.a could be inside it. 
I don't think so, his friend replied. When Hopper sacrificed himself, he must have destroyed XANA in all his forms, right? And then, in any case, we can leave the virtual world at any time by destroying these devices. Yumi was very convincing. Bullrick ended up agreeing. In Kadok's cafeteria, Elita quickly finished a glass of milk, then stood up. Jeremy hadn't finished eating. Where are you going? He asked. Richard is waiting for me in the cafe we went to yesterday, the young girl blushed. We have to continue our discussion. Jeremy felt his chest tighten, I don't understand what you find so interesting about him. Come on, Jeremy. He was a classmate. He knew me before this whole thing started, before Lyoko and the supercomputer. He always came over to my place, and he knows everything about a time in my life that I don't remember anything about. Yes, but well, Jeremy muttered. Tell me, you aren't a little, jealous, by any chance, she said with a small smile. Jealous, me? Are you kidding? Jealous of that fool who doesn't even know how to turn on a computer, and who, don't exaggerate, she retorted. Okay, excuse me, but I have to go. I can't be late. Jeremy watched Elida and her tuft of red hair leave the cafeteria. He ended up eating all alone. Suddenly, he realized that Odd hadn't shown up for lunch, which was very strange, even unbelievable, seeing as he never misses a meal. Where did he go? With the storm that had hit the city, it was probable that he had gone out, and after all, Odd was a little wacky. Jeremy had no desire to remain by himself in the cafeteria. So he quickly grabbed an apple and returned to his room. He did indeed have the intention of studying the strange Hopix codes. With a little effort, he could maybe learn what they're for. He entered his room and remained immobile. Petrified, the dossier. It was no longer on his desk. And he hadn't even made a copy. He inspected the lock on the door, no trace of a break-in. The desk was covered with a thin layer of dust, except for where he had placed the file. Who had come into his room? Normally, Professor Hertz spent her weekends at school shut up in her room. At the end of the week, the staff building was empty and quiet, and that allowed her to prepare her classes in peace. However, today, she couldn't bring herself to concentrate. Images of Furman's Hopper and her past haunted her. Was she right in confiding the Hopper, alias Waldo Schaffer, file to the principal? At the time it had seemed like the best solution, because Delmas knew the outline of what happened, and she trusted him completely. But of course, she knew Jeremy. She knew he would stop at nothing to unveil a mystery. The dossier had become too dangerous. Once again she thought of the apartment in Belgium. The prospect of the teens being able to find it terrorist her to the point that she'd rather not think about it all. Stop thinking about these dark ideas, Susan, she told herself in a reassuring tone. What happened to your cool-headedness? Don, T forget, when you were 20, you were known as the relentless, and now, you, re afraid of confronting these 13 year old kids. It was useless to torture her mind in this way, the only thing that she could do was to act. She then stood from her chair and closed the physics book that she was trying in vain to consult. Then, she took the copies of the keys for the principal's office that she had secretly hidden in a drawer, and moved to exit the room. She would just check to see if the dossier was still in its place, then leave. Always doubt, doubt everything. When she was younger, this simple rule had saved her life many times. She turned into the hallway that led into the principal's office and came face to face with Eva Skinner. She may have been wrong, but she could have sworn she saw the student leaving Delma's office. The young girl smiled widely, and began to speak. Her American accent had almost disappeared. I was looking for the principal, she said. I knocked, but he didn't respond. I think he's taking a walk with his daughter, Hertz responded. And you? Don't you have to be at home, with your parents? I came here to revise our Wednesday homework with my new friends, the young student replied, shrugging. The professor watched Evil leave. She waited until she was out of sight before turning the handle of Delma's office door. It was open. Had the principal forgotten to lock it? Everything seemed in order in his office. She knew where Delma's was keeping the file, in the desk drawer, and its key was hidden in the pen holder. But when she opened it, her heart began to pound, the drawer was empty. But, how, she murmured. She calmly opened the large metallic filing cabinet, then looked through the files in alphabetical order until she found the dossier labeled Waldo Schaffer. So, 
the principal had simply decided to move it. Kurtz let out a big sigh, relieved. Azure doors and rounded roofs like those on Chinese pagodas. Pathways that reached into the sky, like delicate colored ribbons, intertwining around towers that were so high you couldn't see the top. This isn't Lyoko. Bulrick said, confused. But look at us. Yumi cried. The young girl was dressed in the geisha costume that she always wore on Lyoko, with her face painted white and her hair held back by pins. She was wearing her elegant kimono tied to her waist by an obi sash. Bulrick also wore his usual samurai outfit, a short kimono, and on his feet, socks, and traditional geta, a sandal whose strap separates the big toe from the others. The only difference was that the student no longer wore his saber, or katana, on his hip. It looks like we're unarmed, he sighed. I don't like that at all. Yumi responded in a metallic voice. Her voice was distorted by the speakers that they'd both inserted in their motorcycle helmets. The rudimentary instruments didn't appear to allow them to completely enter this replica of Lyoko. The two friends' bodies were still in reality, in the room filled with computers. Well, if things go badly, we can always remove the devices and go back to Earth, right? Bulrick consoled. Try and see. Yumi said. Bulrick placed his hands on his throat, where the helmet was attached. Nothing. His fingers, covered by the gloves, gave him a feeling of smooth skin, and they followed the contour of the face as if there had never been any helmet on his head. He felt nothing. For Ulrich in the replica, these objects didn't exist. There was no way to touch them. So, let's hope that things don't go badly, he breathed. Do you know how we're supposed to move in here? Touch the thumb and index finger on your right hand together, and move the hand in the direction you want to move in. Yumi explained before rocketing off into the sky. Ulrich tried to imitate her. He raised his hand, and fell violently to the ground. Ow! That hurt, he yelled. Yumi hovered around him elegantly. This is weird, she said. It's not like on Lyoko. We're not really here, our bodies are safe in the apartment. Maybe, but in any case, my nose is all swollen. Bulrick moaned. Maybe there are devices in the helmet that make us feel pain, or something like that. We have to contact Jeremy. For a moment, the young boy regretted not calling their whiz kid friend before using the replica, but now it was too late to think about it. Finally, on the second try, he succeeded in taking flight without incident, and Yumi followed him above the city. This fictional oriental looking place was in ruins. Several pathways were damaged and sharp fragments fell to earth in a colorful gush. The walls of the pagodas had a number of cracks in them and the ground was dotted with holes, as if someone had bombed the place. The area seemed completely deserted. The two friends flew over parks where strange glass shrubs had covered everything, engulfing kiosks and trails. Then, transparent bridges overhung the rivers, now dry. Finally, they reached a wall. This wall was the only element that seemed new and fully intact. It was made up of black bricks and it seemed so tall as to touch the sky. Yumi and Ulrich flew high in the air along this gigantic structure, but even after about 10 minutes, they still didn't see an end to it. Ulrich stopped halfway to touch the surface of the structure with his fingers. In doing so, he received some small electric charges. Pfft, he sighed. This wall is endless. An infinite wall? That's impossible. Yumi exclaimed. In reality maybe, but here it isn't. The whole city seems to be protected by this barrier and we can't get over it. There must at least be a door somewhere, the girl suggested. They came back down to the ground and began to search for an opening. And indeed, a short while later, they found a two meter tall door, kept shut by ample black door panels. There was neither lock nor handle to be seen. Bulrick and Yumi tried to push it with all their might, but it was in vain. The door didn't budge even a millimeter. In the end they gave up and leaned against the wall to catch their breath. It may be a virtual world, Bulrick breathed, but we get as breathless here as in the real world. You're, right Yumi stammered, suddenly interrupted by a blue laser beam, which struck her right in the chest. She rolled to the side while Ulrich leapt up. He looked all around him, senses alert, until he saw it. It was a manta ray, one of x.a.n.as monsters, which they'd already confronted during their adventures on Lyoko. The difference between the two fish was that this manta ray used its enormous wing fin to fly, and it shot lasers from the end of its tail. This way. Ulrich cried. Hurry. 
the two friends flew at top speed, pursued by the monster. And new laser beams brushed against them in a burst of light. When it touched me, Yumi remarked, I didn't lose any life points. Are you telling me that we're immortal? Bulric wondered. I sure hope so, his friend responded. But without Jeremy and his supercomputer, we have no weapons or defense. And if we die? It was absurd, and in any case, nothing bad could happen to them. When they die on Lyoko, they immediately return to reality by reappearing in the scanners at the old factory. Why would this be any different? However, Bulric also hit his nose when he fell and it hurt. Therefore, they didn't know exactly how the replica functioned. To tell the truth, they had no idea whatsoever. Suddenly, Bulric saw other manta rays rush at them from above through the clear city sky. Yumi, go down, the young boy yelled, flying into a dot. They landed on the smooth tiles of a building and allowed themselves to slide to the ground in a spiral. Then, they began to run harder. Bulric launched himself towards the gate of an abandoned park overgrown with tall, glass trees. If there are monsters, XANA could also be here, he cried. You didn't notice. Yumi replied, gesturing with her head. The manta rays don't have his symbol. They don't have the eye of XANA like on Lyoko. Probably, but they're still shooting at us. Bulric breathed. The two friends got through the iron gate and flew between the shrubs at low altitude. They were tortuous and thorny, and a funny green azure color. Suddenly, Yumi stopped short, Bulric fell on top of her, and brought them both to the ground. Then, they jumped up. What happened? Bulric cried. Did you see a ghost or what? Yumi didn't respond, but signaled for him to look forward. The student held his breath, Professor Hopper was there, in front of them. No, the girl murmured. That can't be him, not really. It's surely a copy. A replica of Hopper, the professor's face was framed by a beard and a thick pair of glasses. Elita's father seemed translucent and the friends could see right through him, like a ghost. He was wearing a lab coat and had his hands in his pockets. When he saw them, he smiled widely. Children, at last, he exclaimed. I've been waiting so long for children to come here. Come closer. Hopper gestured to them with his head, then disappeared behind a shrub. Bulric and Yumi followed him, but when they got to the other side of the tree, the ghost had already disappeared. Suddenly, a laser hit a branch above their head, sending down a rain of glass leaves that broke loudly upon contact with the ground. The two friends watched, then fled across the park. The manta rays were now twenty in number, and encircled the city. And as soon as they saw the teens, they rushed towards them. What do we do? Bulric asked, worried. I'm afraid that... Yumi couldn't finish her sentence. The monsters had opened fire. If only Anima would stop crashing, I would have more fun editing this. And I hope I don't get copywritten for the updated hunting. So, we know Odd is in trouble by identified Eva and you mean over it are in a replica akin to virtual reality. But what does it all mean? What of Hopper? And what of Jeremy in the in the mystery behind the man with the two dogs? And what if I lead it in Richard later on? Guess more mystery might be solved in the next episode. So comment like and subscribe if you want to stay tuned to the next episode of Ovioko Book Reading. And I'll see you all later. Okay.